Stories from the pages of time. Stories of triumph and tragedy, adventure and achievement, as we go in search of history. Since Columbus, the origin of the indigenous people of the New World has been a source of fanciful speculation and heated scientific debate. Until recently, archaeologists believed that the first Americans were Ice Age nomads who arrived on the continent 11,000 years ago. But startling excavations in North and South America are forcing even the most skeptical scientists to reconsider centuries of hard-won evidence as we go in search of the first Americans. In August 1908, a deadly flash flood swept through the town of Folsom, New Mexico. A few weeks later, the foreman of Crowfoot Ranch, a cowboy named George McJunkin, was checking for fence damage when he spotted large fossilized bones sticking out of a flood-ravaged arroyo. He recognized these were certainly not modern cow bones. They were way too big. They're probably bison, but they're even bigger than modern bison. So he talked this up. You know, anybody who listened to him would tell him about it. But nobody ever went out and checked. Or if they did, they didn't know what they were looking at, for sure, you know. 14 years later, McJunkin died, never knowing that the bones at Wild Horse Arroyo held the answer to a scientific mystery dating back to Christopher Columbus. The indigenous people of America have always fascinated and confused Europeans. Christopher Columbus began the mix-up by calling the natives he met in 1492 Indians. An understandable mistake, considering he thought he had landed in India. The concept of a new world was exciting, but it brought up more questions than answers. In the 15th and 16th centuries, the Bible was considered the sole indisputable source of historical knowledge, yet here was a vast landscape populated with people that the Bible had failed to mention. Attempts by scholars to reconcile the biblical record with contradictory evidence led to some bizarre theories. One popular notion was that the Native Americans were part of the ten lost tribes of Israel. And it was a perennial favorite, actually, for two good reasons. One, it explained who the New World natives were, and two, it solved where the, the lost tribes had been lost all these years. By the 1700s, most conservative scientists, taking note of the unmistakable physical resemblance between American Indians and Asians, hypothesized some form of Asian migration. But for Europeans eager to settle the New World, where the Indians came from was less important than how long they'd been here. One of the ways to justify capturing native peoples and taking native lands was to argue that they hadn't been here for a very long time, that their past was relatively recent. And so they have no particular claim to this land any more than, than, than we do. So force and might makes right. It wasn't until the 1860s that discoveries of stone artifacts alongside the remains of extinct animals in Britain and France established beyond all doubt that man had coexisted with extinct animals thousands of years before recorded history. Inspired by the Europeans, a cadre of American scientists began to search for signs of Paleolithic artifacts in the New World. The enthusiasts soon offered up oddly chipped rocks as proof of human habitation during the Ice Age. But more conservative scientists pointed out that it was not enough that an object looked old. There must also be a solid geological association. The concept here is a very early one in the discipline of geology. It's that uh, you lay down a layer and then it's buried by another layer. It's like a layer's in a cake. So if you 
put the first segment of the cake down and, and uh, you know, put some icing on top of that and then put another layer of cake down, put some icing on that and another, the oldest piece you put down was that first layer. So the sediments are laid down the same way. Uh, they're laid down in increments, and these increments build up strata. And uh, events that take place will be then buried within these strata. In 1926, nearly 20 years after George McJunkin first reported seeing large fossil bones at Folsom, New Mexico, Jesse Figgins, the curator of the Denver Museum of Natural History, decided to investigate. Figgins visited the site himself, then dispatched a man named Carl Schwaheim to do the actual excavation. Now, bear in mind that they did not know that this was an archaeological site. The Denver Museum went to the Folsom site for one purpose and one purpose only, and that was to find and recover the remains of an extinct species of bison that they could put on display. But in 1927, Schwaheim found more than bison, much more. Something which would, in fact, revolutionize American archaeology. A stone spear point laying between the ribs of a bison which had become extinct over 10,000 years ago. The elite of American archaeology quickly descended upon the Folsom site. A.V. Kidder, the dean of early 20th century archaeologists, examined the site and announced that man had been in North America since the Ice Age, thousands of years earlier than anyone had suspected. What it showed was that people had first arrived in the New World at a time when the New World was very, very different than it is today, at a time when the New World was covered by ice sheets, ice sheets which stretched from Nova Scotia in the east clear over to British Columbia in the west. Ice sheets that reached from the Arctic Circle all the way down to what's now central Ohio. Over the next few years, more sites with Folsom-style artifacts were discovered using the same surprisingly simple method inspired by George McJunkin at Wild Horse Arroyo. Look for bones, then look for artifacts. What happens after Folsom, of course, is that we discover a whole series of these sites out on the plains, kill sites more often than not, which leads to this very distinctive notion of Paleo-Indians as big game hunters. The lifestyle of the Folsom Paleo-Indians revolved around an extinct type of bison that once roamed the area by the millions. These early Americans, like the Plains Indians that followed, were clever, efficient hunters. Many kill sites appeared to be well-coordinated events where bison were herded into natural rock corrals or, in some cases, off the edge of steep embankments. The Folsom culture, at 10,500 years before present, provided enough chronological elbow room to account for the level of sophistication to which the Aztec, Maya, and Inca civilizations had evolved by the time of the Spanish conquest. But some archaeologists suspected that the story was only just unfolding. In 1927, archaeologists in Folsom, New Mexico, discovered human artifacts alongside the bones of extinct bison, proving that man had inhabited North America during the Ice Age. Six years later, in 1933, archaeologists working near the tiny town of Clovis, New Mexico, unearthed artifacts with fossil bones of a different kind. Here, a stone spear point was found wedged between the ribs of a mammoth, an Ice Age elephant that had been extinct for 11,000 years. The Paleo-Indian who put it there proved to predate the Folsom people by at least 500 years. The spear points found at Clovis resembled the Folsom version, even down to the distinctive flutes near the base. But the point itself was over twice the size. It's large, it's heavy, 
it is something that is probably much more massive than you would need for uh, hunting a lot of the smaller game. The Clovis Point is well designed to hunt mammoths. In the decades that followed, Clovis Points began to turn up at sites virtually everywhere in North America. The geographical scope of the Clovis culture was impressive, but even more so was the speed with which the primitive technology had spread. Armed with radiocarbon dating methods, archaeologists confirmed that the Clovis culture had literally swept the Americas in less than 800 years. Another source of wonder for modern archaeologists was that Clovis people actually hunted mammoth. At one mammoth kill site near Naco, Arizona, eight spear points were found in the skeleton of a single animal. Butchering an elephant using Stone Age technology was no easy task, as Professor Bruce Huckle and some graduate students learned in 1975 when they attempted to process a deceased circus elephant using nothing but authentic Clovis tools. Physically, it was hard work. You were constantly cutting and moving meat off of the, the carcasses for a period of four to six hours. It literally took two or three people working together to ensure that you could be efficient about it. But hunting a mammoth was a dangerous undertaking, and one that many archaeologists believe was the exception rather than the rule. There's two kinds of risk. One is the risk of coming home empty-handed. Hi, honey, I'm home and I missed the elephant and so we're not going to eat tonight. The second risk is coming home dead. But of course the rewards potentially are quite great as well. If you can kill successfully an elephant, you have gotten access to several hundred if not a few thousand pounds of meat and other products, bone for the manufacture of bone tools, sinew for hafting tools, potentially even uh, using other portions of the elephant like the tusks for flint napping tools, things of, of that sort. My suspicion is, is that uh, if a Clovis group did kill a mammoth, they probably did so once and then spent the rest of their lives talking about it. Armed with 20th century theories about the Ice Age world, archaeologists now trace the path of migration that had delivered these earliest Americans to the New World. During the coldest Ice Age periods, 5% of the Earth's water was diverted from the sea and frozen on land in vast glaciers. Starting around 25,000 years ago, lowered sea levels exposed the shallow continental shelf beneath the Bering and Chukchi seas. This expanse of new terrain formed a land bridge known as Beringia, over which animals and human beings could migrate from the old world to the new. Old world archaeological evidence places early Homo sapiens in Siberia and northern China 39,000 years ago. Sometime later, an intrepid group of Siberian people followed familiar game herds eastward into Alaska. So that the first Americans working their way over from Asia would not really have discerned that they were in a new world. Because in fact, Beringia, the continent, and Alaska were very much like Siberia. Crossing from Siberia may have posed no significant challenge to these hardy nomads, but the passage south into the lower 48 states was effectively blocked by glaciers. Coming together around 20,000 years ago, these ice sheets covered parts of southern Alaska and virtually all of modern-day Canada. However, near the end of the Ice Age, these glaciers may have receded enough to create an ice-free corridor through which people could have passed. If, in fact, the ice-free corridor was closed up until about 12,000, and if, in fact, Clovis groups 
are the first Americans, and they do appear initially on the southern high plains at about 11,500, well, then that fits all very, very nicely together. But new sites, new science, and radical new ideas about human migration would soon challenge prevailing wisdom about the antiquity and path of America's first inhabitants. By the 1960s, most archaeologists embraced the Clovis first model of human migration into the New World. According to this theory, the Clovis people had entered the Americas along the Beringia land bridge, then migrated through an ice-free corridor just in time to explode onto the North American frontier 11,200 years ago. You've got Clovis all over the place. It seems to be at the bottom of every stratigraphic section, and nothing is below that. So nothing is seemingly older than that. Many of these sites, you have deposits, older deposits, that still have the same fauna. They still have mammoth, horse, bison, camel, and uh, just immediately older than Clovis, and you don't find any evidence of people. But the Clovis model had weak links that suggested there was more to the story. One thing that nagged at even the most ardent Clovis first supporters was their failure to find signs of Clovis culture north of Canada in either Alaska or the area of the ice-free corridor. There's been a fair amount of archaeological research done in the area that was the ice-free corridor, and we've been unable to find any archaeological sites that really date older, much older than about 10,500 years ago. So this suggests that people moved into that area relatively late. Another source of debate among archaeologists was the time frame, less than 800 years, during which the Clovis technology had radiated throughout North America. Was this the result of a tremendously rapid migration, or the sign of a new technology spreading across an existing population? If you had uh, a previous population that these things diffused across, we would certainly, I think, find it in the stratigraphic record, and we aren't. But when you have people entering new territory, and they're explorers, they're exploring, and they're wondering what's over the next mountain, and maybe in the next valley, that could carry people, I think, to the southern end of South America uh, in a period of uh, 500, 800 years. And it's very, very difficult to get people to move that quickly across so many different kinds of environments, to go from high altitude settings in the Rockies out onto the plains and into the eastern forests and then down into the southern forests. That didn't make a lot of sense. By the 1970s, some archaeologists were questioning the viability of the ice-free corridor. A new theory held that the first Americans used primitive rafts and skim boats to move along the lower coast of Beringia then traveled south along Alaska and British Columbia, only then trekking inland. New geological surveys revealing that areas of the northwest coast had not been fully glaciated during the Ice Age made this coastal migration theory more feasible. We have now learned that toward the end of the last Ice Age, the last uh, glacial advance, that uh, the ice going out to the continental shelf or to the ocean were actually uh, individual glaciers or tongues of ice uh, between which there were pockets of land or refugia in which plants and animals and uh, possibly humans could have uh, survived. There is abundant evidence that people throughout the world have been building watercraft and navigating open stretches of water for tens of thousands of years. Humans first colonized Australia without benefit of a land bridge 60,000 years ago. Most archaeologists agree this incredible feat was achieved by watercraft. A North American coastal route, in theory, had many other advantages. Food resources like seal, fish, and shellfish were readily available year-round. Also, moving swiftly and easily in a watercraft might be a distinct advantage when traveling with extended families and children. We have to look at human colonization as a very realistic human event. 
uh, not just a few young males out hunting bison and mammoths, uh, but these are family units that had to be reproductive, viable um, uh, economic units in, in prehistoric society. Though intriguing, the coastal migration theory failed to generate much support for one simple reason. It was virtually impossible to prove one way or the other. Most of the coastline that would have been present in the Ice Age is now underwater. Because of course what happens at the end of the Ice Age is all those huge glaciers melt. Sea levels come back up and the coastline from 18,000 is now 200 feet underwater. Since 1933, more than a hundred archaeological sites all over the Americas have made claims of great antiquity. Tule Springs, Nevada, Vasaquillo, Mexico, Picimachi Cave in Peru. All these carefully excavated Paleo-Indian sites promised to break the Clovis barrier, then crumbled under the weight of rigorous scientific scrutiny. In 1965, Dr. Louis Leakey, fresh from his triumphant discovery of two million year old hominids in Africa, stung the world when he announced that evidence of early man had turned up at a 100,000 year old site in the Mojave Desert. Over the next three years, Leakey and colleague Ruth Simpson examined millions of rocks at Calico Hills, California, and found a few hundred curiously chipped and flaked specimens that, according to Leakey, were probably stone tools fashioned by primitive humans. But the consensus within the archaeological community was that Leakey was mistaken. The Calico artifacts were actually geofacts, the natural product of an ancient landslide system that had been pushing and grinding rocks for eons. So the question is, how do you separate out, in the midst of millions of broken stones, ones that might be made by humans, when in fact, the ones that might be made by humans may also have been made naturally? Leakey was not alone in his disappointment. In the years that followed, similar mistakes, plus other factors like confusing stratigraphy, led to the downfall of many sites hailed as pre-Clovis. And what happened over time was that archaeologists became skeptical, because so many of these pre-Clovis contenders failed that if a new one would come along, the immediate reaction is, eh, I don't think so. It was into this atmosphere of pervasive skepticism that one of the most famous American archaeological sites of the 1970s was thrust. The Meadowcroft Rock Shelter in Pennsylvania is considered to be one of the finest and most extensive interdisciplinary excavations in the world. Shortly after work was begun, this humble rock overhang was enclosed in an elaborate structure that protected it from the elements and allowed Professor James Atavasio and his graduate students to work the site year-round. The building was electrified. It had a computer connection to the mainframe at the University of Pittsburgh. It had telephones. It had electrical outlets, places you could plug in diamond drills to cut through rocks, an experimental lighting system that Westinghouse put in that let us control the hue, intensity, and chroma of the lights. Over the last 25 years, the Meadowcroft Cross Creek site has yielded 20,000 human artifacts, as well as the bones of 169 different species of animals. No single archaeological site has shed more light on the prehistory of this region. But it's a stormy academic debate over pre-Clovis evidence that has ensured Meadowcroft's place in scientific history. The controversy began in 1974, when Atavasio and his team excavated a layer of sediment 16 feet below the cave floor. We began to at progressively greater depths to recover materials that we were familiar with and then all of a sudden materials we weren't familiar with that represented kinds of things that quote unquote should not have been there. What Atavasio and his team found in Stratum 2A was a spear point as well as other stone cutting tools and even remnants of basketry. 
Based on the geology, Atavasio guessed that the objects might be as old as 11 or 12,000 years. We then submitted samples for radiocarbon dating, and some of them came out in, in our view, anomalously old. And we thought, well, what's going on here? The radiocarbon date associated with the oldest artifact was 14,250 years before present. The idea of a pre-Clovis site on the east coast of North America rocked the archaeological community. Such a date meant that Paleo-Indians were camping at the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter 3,000 years before Clovis people had entered from Alaska. Faced with a meticulous excavation boasting 52 radiocarbon dates in precise stratigraphic order, many scientists were convinced that the Clovis barrier had finally been smashed. But archaeologist Vance Haynes, a strong Clovis first advocate, suggests that ancient coal may have contaminated the radiocarbon samples and inflated their actual ages. You're in the Pennsylvania coal area, and in fact there is a, uh, uh, an abandoned open pit coal mine not too far away and up above the site so that water leaching down through that and then leaching out of the bluffs into the, into the river could contaminate stuff. For those who still think for whatever reason that they are contaminated, it's beholden on them to demonstrate that that's the case. And none of them, even with samples they've collected themselves, have ever been able to do that. Regardless, the specter of contamination, never proven but still hotly debated, has cast a pall of ambiguity over the Meadowcroft site that may never be lifted. More than a decade ago, I decided that those that I wished to convince about the antiquity of the site had already been convinced. For those that prefer to believe that Clovis represents the pioneer population in the New World, it's all right with me if they do, in fact, maintain that belief until they retire or are dead. While archaeologists fought it out in the trenches, linguists were helping to shed light on the question by studying the diverse languages of Native Americans. At the time of first European contact, it is estimated that well over 1,000 distinct languages were being spoken by Native Americans. Thomas Jefferson, 18th century statesman, historian, and free thinker, was also one of the earliest scholars to recognize that the diverse languages of North and South Americans could only be accounted for by a time scale of many thousands of years. Throughout the 19th century, linguists and ethnologists tried to sort the bewildering array of Native American tongues into common families. In 1891, the Bureau of American Ethnology classified North American languages into 58 common linguistic groups. By 1926, these groups had been reduced even further to just six. In 1987, Stanford University linguist Joseph Greenberg claimed to have clustered every Native American language, including those of South Americans, into three distinct families, Amerind, Nadine, and Eskimo Aleut. According to Greenberg, these groups indicated three separate and distinct migrations into the New World, with Clovis culture as the earliest Amerind group. But other linguists, believing that Greenberg's theory was flawed, insisted on a single migration going back at least 30,000 years, a time scale that predates the arrival of the Clovis culture by 18,000 years. Meanwhile, surprising new evidence from the field of human genetics seemed to support this time scale. By looking at the genetic distance or the genetic difference between New World populations and Asian populations, you can infer the time 
that has elapsed since those two populations have split from one another. In this case, the molecular clock was telling geneticists that old world ancestors had departed for North America perhaps as long as 40,000 years ago. But linguistic and genetic models are based on living populations, not hard archaeological evidence. In the 1970s and 80s, New World excavations were going on throughout Central and South America. Here, archaeologists with no real investment in the Clovis First argument sought clues to the cultural and ecological factors which led to the magnificent Maya, Aztec, and Inca civilizations. With so much digging going on, it was inevitable that early Paleo-Indian sites would also turn up. And some of these, like Tema Tema in Venezuela and Pedra Fiorada in Brazil, were reported to be 12,000 years and older. The most intriguing of these lay in the Chilean lowlands along the sandy banks of Chinchahuapi Creek. First excavated in 1976 by Professor Tom Dillahay of the University of Kentucky, it was called Monte Verde. Here, Dillahay and a team of archaeologists from the Southern University of Chile found remnants of a 12,500-year-old Paleo-Indian camp. A water-saturated peat bog had formed over the site just after the Monte Verde people moved on, resulting in a rare and remarkable state of preservation. We found extremely well-preserved wooden implements, chunks of mastodon uh, meat. We also found uh, several pieces of animal hide. And in general, a lot of well-preserved material that you normally don't find in archaeological sites. I'd never excavated anything like that before. And it was just a, a sense of uh, exhilaration throughout the excavation. Three structures comprise this ancient human camp. The largest, probably the main living quarters, was partitioned into smaller units by lengths of timber that had been staked into position and tied with knots of reed. Immediately outside the main structure were clay-lined fire pits, communal hearths where the 20 or 30 Monteverde occupants may have gathered. But perhaps the most heart-touching experience for me during the excavation of Monte Verde was the recovery of a footprint in mud next to a fire pit. And actually there were three footprints, but one was beautifully preserved. And it showed the depression of the heel, the rise of the arc, and the five toe impressions. Located 30 yards from the main tent was a wishbone-shaped structure clearly isolated from the rest of the camp. Dillahay believes that this structure was a medicine hut. On the floor of this wishbone-shaped structure, we found the parts of what we think were 26 different species of medicinal plants. These plant species are used today by the local Wailiche and Mapuche Native Americans for curing certain ailments, intestinal problems, skin irritation and chest or pulmonary diseases as well. That may imply that there was a sort of a specialist, medicinal person, handling that particular aspect of life and curing some fellow members of the group. Incredibly, a wad of chewed medicinal leaves was found on the floor of the medicine hut, just where it had been spit out 12,000 years ago. The astounding preservation of wood at Monte Verde allowed Dillahay to radiocarbon test actual artifacts, resulting in radiocarbon dating of unprecedented accuracy and reliability. The final validation of Monte Verde in the eyes of the archaeological community, as well as the world, came in 1997 
when a panel of renowned archaeologists, some of them staunch Clovis First advocates, traveled first to Kentucky to view the artifacts, then to Monteverde, Chile, to examine the excavation site. The entire site team, to a person, came away satisfied that Monteverde was indeed a new world human occupation dating to at least 12,500 years. But everybody knew what the subtext to all that was, because, because everybody knew that 12.5 at Monteverde means we've got to go back and completely rewrite the books on our notions of when people came into the Americas, the routes by which they would have come, their adaptations, and on and on and on. If people settled the southernmost point in the Americas a full thousand years before Clovis culture, when must this extraordinary journey have begun? And why is there no evidence anywhere in the Americas of the Monte Verde people as they moved south? Now, does that mean that we haven't looked in the right places? Does it mean we haven't looked in the right ways? Perhaps both are correct. In the wake of Monte Verde, there has been a renaissance of scientific activity aimed at solving the riddle of New World migration. The Monte Verde dates of 12,500 are providing support for theories of migration already indicated by DNA research. Recently, genetic scientists at the University of Arizona found evidence for two separate migrational events originating in Siberia thousands of years earlier than the Clovis first theory allowed. The need to put the Monte Verde dates into perspective has also led to renewed interest in the coastal migration theory. One of the things that has been suggested for Monte Verde is that it may represent a coastal migration of groups that are working their way down uh, the west coast of North America and then subsequently down the west coast of South America. And that may be why we don't see their traces in the interior of North America because they effectively skirted down the coast and did not penetrate the interior. Exciting new archeological work taking place along the coast of Alaska and Canada is showing that the coastal migration theory is not only possible, but scientifically provable. For the last five years, Dr. James Dixon of the Denver Museum of Natural History has been exploring and excavating caves on the islands along the southeast coast of Alaska. Here we've discovered the remains of animals uh, that date to the end of the last ice age between 14 and uh, 10,000 years ago that clearly indicate there were resources available for humans to make a living along that coast at that time period. These include the remains of ring seal, brown bears, black bears, and caribou. These are uh, large terrestrial mammals that require a food base very similar to humans, particularly bears. If large omnivores can live in this type of environment, so can humans. Dixon recovered a bone tool dated 10,300 and also unearthed human remains, including the jawbone of a male in his early 20s that dated at 9,200 before present. Isotopic analysis of the skeletal material indicated that the man subsisted almost entirely on a diet of marine foods. Just south of Alaska, along the coast of British Columbia, archaeologist Darrell Fedje and geologist Heiner Josenhans have taken a high-tech approach to the question of coastal migration. Using the data from swath bathymetric studies, they created a three-dimensional model of the continental shelf off the Queen Charlotte Islands. So by identifying the very types of locations underwater that we know to find archeological sites above water, they were able to identify areas where humans may have lived in the prehistoric past when sea level was lower. In the summer of 1997, Fedje and Josenhans maneuvered their research vessel over the site of an ancient river delta. The team dropped sampling buckets to the ocean floor 150 feet below, then filtered and examined thousands of pounds of sediment from the Pleistocene shore. 
Remarkably, on their fourth day of sampling, the team brought up their first artifact, a stone cutting tool. Presuming the sea level curve is correct, this artifact should date between about 10,300 years ago, which corresponds beautifully with the date on the bone tool we've recovered from our cave in southeast Alaska. This firmly establishes that humans were occupying the northwest coast of North America when sea level was lower during the last ice age. In coming seasons, archaeologists hope to push the human time scale along the coast far enough back to support the Monte Verde dates and identify man's earliest route into the new world. The search for the first Americans is certain to frustrate and fascinate the archaeological community for years to come. But the arduous path of scientific inquiry pales in contrast with the epic journey those Stone Age humans embarked on thousands of years ago. Why did they trek so far and so long? What force urged them onward into exotic frontiers? Perhaps the same unquenchable curiosity that compels modern-day scientists to go in search of history.